Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. There are 129 national monuments in the United States. Two of those are right here in Wyoming. You know of one, Devil's Tower. Where's the other? Welcome to Fossil Butte National Monument in Southwest Wyoming. It's a home of more fish fossils than anywhere else in the world. We'll tour Fossil Butte next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. Uh, my name is Amanda Wilson. I'm a supervisory park ranger here at Fossil Butte National Monument. And today we're going to be walking up the nature trail and checking out our research quarry. And I'm Liz Bargell and I'm our geoscientist in the parks intern. And so when we get up to the research quarry, I will show you all about the fossils that we're finding up there and the rocks we're looking at which is actually a mass mortality of a school of fish. So we're about 10 miles outside of Kemmer, Wyoming, on, off Highway 30. So we get about 20,000 visitors each year to Fossil Butte National Monument. Uh, many of those are people who are passing through the area and decide to stop to check it out. So our elevation here at the monument is at about 7,000 feet uh, at the visitor center. So that's something for visitors to keep in mind is that we're at a pretty high elevation here if they're not used to it. It's one of the things people come here to see are the incredible fossils that we have here at Fossil Butte. The best place to do that is actually in our visitor center. So today we're out walking on the nature trail and we'll check out the research quarry, but later in the broadcast we'll, we'll go down to the visitor center and see all the fossils we have on display. And some of the fossils that you can see in the visitor center are a 13-foot crocodile, or a crocodilian, I should say. Um, turtles, we have turtles on display. Um, a horse, an early horse from the Eocene era, and many different kinds of fish. And this, this um, is all part of what used to be almost like a Great Lake system, the Green River Lake system, that existed in Wyoming about 50 million years ago? About 50 million years ago, yep. So we are a part of a three lake system. So Fossil Lake is the lake that we have here. It was the smallest of those lakes um, and has the best preserved fossils from that time period. So what we're known for at Fossil Butte is actually not only the preservation, but the diversity and the abundance of fossils that we find here as well. So diversity being all sorts of different types of fish, mammals and turtles and crocodiles that tell the story of this whole ecosystem that used to be here. And then we also have the abundance. There are so many fossils that you can find in this area that it's really some of the best preserved fish fossils in the whole world. Give us a sense of the environment that we're talking about 50 million years ago because we all think of Southwest Wyoming as it is today, but in fact, it was really different. Yeah, so about 52 million years ago, this whole area was like a subtropical environment. So basically similar to the Gulf Coast or Florida today. This whole area was basically teeming with life uh, of, the, it's of this tropical environment. So there were crocodiles and turtles and fish all living in this lake, as well as a diverse ecosystem with palm trees and all sorts of tropical plants located outside the shores of the lake. How much did you lose by people who were here in the early 1900s just scavenging along? Yeah, I think um, kind of the answer to that is less from people scavenging is more from erosion. Like there's actually just these kind of pockets and there's a really great map in the visitor center that we can look at that shows all the like remaining sediments of Fossil Lake and where they are because really it's just like this huge kind of area um, that's been lost to erosion. So are, is there a tension between commercial um, commercial explorers, if you will, and then the, the public concerns of what it means to be a national monument? Well, we work really closely with all the quarries that are located outside the monument. Um, we have a really great relationship with them that actually most of the fossils that you see in our visitor center were actually found from quarries located outside the monument. So our relationship with them is really great. <laughs> So Amanda, how do people learn about Fossil Butte National Monument? What does your research tell you about how a tourist 
discovers that you're here. Yeah, so a lot of people uh, lately have been look us up on the internet, kind of first thing. Uh, many people traveling through the area are traveling to these other kind of big, well-known parks like Yellowstone and Grand Teton, um, and then happen to look us up on their way as a place to stop along the way. Or there's several signs that people see on the highway that direct them right to us right here. So Amanda, at the top of the show, we referred to Fossil Butte National Monument as the other National Monument in Wyoming. The other one being, of course, Devil's Tower, but really, the National Park Service administers several sites in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are actually six different sites in Wyoming that the National Park Service administers. So there's Yellowstone, Grand Teton, which are the ones everybody's heard of, uh, Devil's Tower, Fort Laramie National Historic Site, us here at Fossil Butte, and then Bighorn Canyon. When people come here, what surprises them the most? Is it the fact that, gosh, I've never heard about this place and look what, I, look what I'm finding? What, what surprises people when they come here? Yeah, that's definitely the reaction that we get from people who come here is, this is an amazing place and they may have never heard of it before and they're really surprised to find it right in their backyard. So I came here as a visitor uh, several years ago and was just blown away uh, by the fossils that are here and just walked in the visitor center and was completely had my mind blown um, by how incredible they are. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but are some people um, maybe uh, less enthused when they, they're not walking out on a lake bed and seeing thousands of fossils that they can just maybe pick up, but really they're here, but there's so much science and whatnot that you present. Is, is that kind of a, um, I am um, the tractor for some folks, if, for lack of a better word. I think some folks, after they come into the visitor center and understand the process of actually what it takes to get that fossil out of the rock and how much work actually goes into that, they have a much better understanding of why they're just not all over the place. And Liz, in your time here, and you haven't been here a long time, mm -mm. but what have you discovered about that process and about this place? Well, it definitely takes a while to document fossils, first of all, and then also to get them out of the ground. And so when visitors come up and see that process in the research quarry firsthand, like Amanda said, they do have a better appreciation of what we have here and why we have them in the visitor center for them to see. So Amanda, for researchers like Liz, how does that process work? There are pe people not only from around the country, but from around the world that want to come here. How does, that, how does that function? Yeah, so the first step in that is getting a permit. So you do need a permit to do research inside a National Park Service site. Um, so the first step is getting that permit, which is a pretty painless process. Um, and basically, it's they just have to present their research and what they're looking to learn from us as their resource. In your history of, of, of understanding what people are looking for, what, what is it? What, is, what excites researchers about here? Yeah, the fish fossils is the is definitely the big thing that people come here to do research on. We are one of the best places in the world to look at fossil fish, and that can tell us a lot about both the history of fish and the history of the environment and the ecology in this area and around the world. So we're now in a part of the National Monument that is off limits to visitors, but it's really active with research. And Liz, this is kind of your, your part of the place. It is, so we are at the entrance to the research quarry. So on Fridays and Saturdays during the summer months, visitors are able to come up this trail and visit me in the research quarry where they can help participate in gathering research. And what does that mean? What does that mean when they participate? What is it that they can expect to maybe do? So I put a pencil and notebook in their hand and they help me document information about fossils. So all sorts of information such as length, side, articulation, orientation, visitors can expect to help in. Tell me what articulation means. Articulation is essentially how pretty the fossil is, how well complete is the fossil. So one thing for visitors to keep in mind if they come up here to the research quarry is they aren't actually digging fossils, but they're helping measure and collect that data. So it's a little bit different than you may imagine. Um, there's no actual splitting of the rock, but you can still help us with collecting that data. But that's really important is to the scientific process. It, it's helped, it probably speeds you up a little bit in what you're able to do. Definitely, so there's a lot of fossils up there as you guys will get to see once we reach the research quarry and visitors helping collect data is very helpful to me. Give me an idea of maybe someone a first grader or a second grader, they can still participate. Yes, anyone can participate no matter their age. As long as they're willing to help look for fossils and collect that data, they can help participate. 
Now, the one thing I think we should point out is we have climbed a little bit mm -hmm. on the trail this morning. And for maybe some of our older viewers, it's something that might may be out of their ability to do, but that doesn't prohibit them from enjoying the National Monument. No, not at all. And as we've talked about a few times, the Visitor Center is a great place that you can see all this process at work as well um, without actually having to walk all the way up here. All right, so we are here in our research quarry and what you are looking at is the layer that I am working on. The rock that you're seeing right in front of us used to be the bottom of this ancient fossil lake. So we are looking at about 52 million year old rock and also fossils. Now, the rock that you're looking at is a fine sedimentary rock. Think of the bottom of a lake. It's very silty and soft. Now, the fossils that you are seeing in here are slightly hidden, but all of the numbers and boxes that you see right now, these are indicating fossils that we have here on this layer right now. And every number is a fossil. To me, that looks like almost like a seahorse type thing, but it really isn't. Well, you see that kind of large dip that's his stomach. So we're looking at his head okay. and this long little ridge of raised bumps right here is his spine. And so we're kind of looking at his rib cage and what we call his anal fins on the bottom over here. The thing that's interesting to me is this is really fragile. It is. I mean, if you were to step on this, you would break it. It is. So we have actually been working up here in the research quarry for 21 years. This is the 21st year someone has been up here documenting data on fossils in these layers. And each of these layers are given a number. Currently, this very thin layer that we're seeing right now is called the 128 layer, and it is that thin. It is paper thin. So that's less than maybe an eighth of an inch. Correct, correct. And so I am looking for fossils on and within this one eighth of an inch fossil rich layer. The layer below, someone else will probably be doing that, another intern. And does that layer below mean one year earlier, maybe, or a few years <laughs> earlier, or what does that mean? So as we go down in the rock, we're getting older with time, mm -hmm. but we can't say one inch of sediment or these rock layers equals, you know, 100,000 years. And the reason is, is because the rates of deposition of sediment throughout this lake were varying. They're all very different. So we are unable to say one inch equals 100,000 years or one million years at that. And this is a lake that's estimated to have been here about two million years. Is that Correct. accurate? Yes, for a very long time. This lake had a long lifespan, but just two million years it was here. Two million mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. 52 million years ago. Correct. Correct. <laughs> so would you like to help me document some information? Absolutely, that'd be great. Okay, so we can go ahead and document this one, the one we see in this black box. The black box that you see represents cut marks, so I will use a circular saw to eventually remove this from the rock to bring it to our collections. So I'm going to go ahead and give this pencil to you, and what your first task is, is to write on the rock, and what you need to do is outline his spine with the pencil. How close do you want me to get? You can go on it or right next to it. So that helps us find the fossil again. All right, so looking at this fossil, are you able to pick out where his head and where his tail is? Quite honestly, because you told me, I, I, <laughs> I know where it is. But yes, yes, I think I could figure that out, that his tail is here. It's, yep. It seems to be thinner, mm -hmm. and his head would be in this area. Okay, mm -hmm. so go ahead and draw in a little fork for his tail, just so we kind of remember that end is his I tail. Like that. Correct. Okay. So now what we do in this notebook is we document all of this information. So the fossil that you are now working on is fossil number 4,442. Okay, tell me what that number means. We have found 4,442 fossils in this research quarry in the past 21 years. In this small area. In this right small here, 4, area. 4,000 fossils. There are a lot of fossils. Sure <laughs> and there's still more to be found. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Even more. So the first thing that I'm going to need you to do is measure. So do you fish at all? A little bit, maybe. <laughs> Not a lot. Not a lot. Well, you might be familiar with the fisherman's measurement. They measure from the tip of the mouth to the tail. Okay. Here in the quarry, we measure from the tip of the mouth to the last vertebrae of the spine. Okay. So we are using centimeters on this tape measure. Okay. So go ahead and line up where you think the tip of his mouth is to his last vertebrae on the spine. 
it's hard for me to tell exactly where the tip of the tobacco is, but so I'm it, guessing. It's gonna be right in here. Right there you go. There. So we yep. are seven centimeters. Do you agree I'd with that? I'd say a little bit shorter. A little more accurate, so maybe um, <laughs> 68 millimeters. There we go. Okay. We're gonna go with 6.8. So what I need you to do right here in this box is write 6.8 centimeters for me. And then the next thing that we need to figure out is what side is this fish laying on? So you have to pretend to be the fish. <laughs> so if our head is pointing this way and our stomach is pointing towards the rock wall over here, what side might we might we be laying on? If a fish, fish knows right and left, I would yes. suggest right. <laughs> right, exactly. What could that tell us about the environment? What do you think? Boy. Um... I well, wouldn't know. So think about what fish live in. They live in water. So the direction or which side the fish are laying on can tell us about the current of the water of the lake. So that's why we're documenting this information. So would the current have been coming this way then? So pushing. We would have to see a pattern. Okay. And right now we're not seeing a pattern, okay. but that's why we're documenting everything so we can look at the big picture. So Liz, again, one of the reasons things were so well preserved is there was salt at the bottom of the lake. And when the fish fell into the sediment, the salt prevented predators mm -hmm. from eating the fish. Why was there more salt at the bottom of the lake and fresh water above? Yeah, so that is one thing that is still being studied today. And one of the theories that we have about why there was more salt in this lake was because the amount of water coming into the lake was about equal to the amount of water being evaporated from the lake. And so that was leaving behind what we call evaporites, which was creating the water to be salty. And so salt water is denser and it's going to sink below the fresh water to the bottom of the lake. And we're in this small area in this quarry, mm -hmm. but this lake was 50 miles long. And so there are really quarries like this available to be researched in years to come in a huge span of land. Correct. What we're looking at here is sediment that was near to the shore. So we were close to the edge of the lake. Now, another thing that we could do to find out more about this ancient lake to do a little bit more research is to do the same thing, detailed research, only in the deep water sediments of the lake. So that way we have a comparison between the two different edges of the lake. And we've talked a lot about fish and how this is such a great, there, there are more fish fossils here maybe than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. But on shore, we're talking maybe palm trees and things like that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It sure but wait, is. We're in south, <laughs> southwest Wyoming. Yeah, huh? it doesn't really feel sure. like it today. <laughs> 50 million years ago, that's, that's what also people have discovered here. Yeah, and so it just depends on what part of the lake and what layers you're in Bas is basically tell us different things about what was actually in the lake. So it's pretty rare to find um, things that are other than fish. So those palm trees and leaves and especially the mammals are much more rare to find. You have to think about how would a palm tree get into the lake sure. in order to become a fossil and that process process is much more difficult than for a fish. Mm -hmm. Arvid Osa, who is a museum curator here at Fossil Butte National Monument, now joins us on Wyoming Chronicle. Arvid, welcome. Thank you. Everything that we see here is, is your responsibility and your thought and your creation. Let's start with what are the challenges that you have in presenting um, the fossils and all of what we see here at Fossil Butte National Monument to the public? What goes through your mind as you're, as you're creating these displays? Well, first, with limited space, so we have to work within the space we're provided. And so we've uh, modified through the years with what space we had. Harpers Ferry uh, Center in West Virginia initially designed the mounting system or how they presented with the 3D effect. And we mimic that as we've added, for example, this plant wall, we call it our plant wall, uh, to give that 3D effect, which people appreciate. So the artistic presentation and make it changeable. Initially, they weren't changeable. These we can change. And so we can adjust it as new things are found. When these exhibits were first designed, there weren't these many fossil plants known. And so as we've collected them from the quarries outside of the park, the commercial quarries, and we've acquired them from them through donation, sometimes purchase, then we've been able to put this collection together, but we keep adding more and more. So if we find something that's significant, we can then 
tweak the arrangement and stick it in. So that's one of the things, is keeping things current is really tough. So do, do displays change here? If somebody hasn't been here, say, for five, six, seven years, is it a little bit different today? The first big change, the, the visitor center was built and dedicated in 1990, and no major or significant additions to the exhibits were done for 15 years, uh, nope, 20 years, 20 years. In 19, uh, 2010, we added this case, plus uh, one, two, three other, four, four other cases, plus the outside timeline. The timeline used to be on this wall, a minimalistic timeline of the Earth's history. It was intended to be moved when we had a better idea for the space, and so we did that in 2010. Added this case, four other cases, increased the number of fossils on exhibit from 80 to over 300 fossils on exhibit. At the same time, some of these other cases in the room, we changed out. Two years later, we changed some more cases in this room. In 2015, we added the uh, Eocene dioramas on the ends here. Mm -hmm. And just this year, we added a new exhibit outside in its own little structure. So we keep trying to keep things current, keep things up to date as we have the funds and project money. One of the things we wanted to explore with you, Arvid, was um, a little more scientific detail about why these fossils are so well preserved here. And that's a, that's a good question. Uh, Fossil Lake was an alkaline lake. It was, uh, think of it as hard water precipitating out of the water and settling on the bottom, creating the laminated limestones that we have. We've gotten more understanding as we get more information through the years. Uh, first, when they first found these deposits, and we're describing them, uh, Bradley with the United States Geological Survey, uh, said, oh, these fish can't live here because you can't have fish living in a lake that's precipitating limestone. They just can't. It, the water conditions wouldn't be right. But the lowly coprolite corrected that. Fossil fish poo, fossil feces, was found in with these fish. Very delicate. You can't get that delicate coprolite to wash out 10 miles from shore, settle to the bottom, and still be perfectly articulated. That told them the fish were actually living here in the lake, which then begged the question, how? If we're getting this precipitation and we're getting this exceptional preservation, how are the fish living in the lake? Through time, using evidences like uh, volcanic ash beds that uh, in the middle of the lake are preserved as a case bar alteration near shore, they're clay. So that's telling you the same ash is preserving differently. And that's an indication with that case bar alteration in the middle of the lake that there was salt water at the base of the lake in the center and fresh above that all the way across the lake. So those fish were living in the fresh, albeit alkaline water up above, and we have salty water down below. And so with that condition, the fish could live up here, and it was somewhat alkaline, and if they died when they died and went to the bottom, you had this barrier for scavenging, barrier for microbes that protected them on the bottom in that saltier water. New things all the time. New leaves every year. Just a month ago, a new fossil was found. It's only about this big, partial, naturally broken before it was preserved. Might be an eel first one ever found. It's exciting with the new things that are found all the time. Every year there's new things being found, whether it's a fossil or new geologic features of the lake, and it helps us understand it better. Arvid, thank you so much for joining us on this segment with thank you. Wyoming Chronicle. So Amanda, we're outside now on the patio of the visitor center with the beautiful Vista of Fossil Butte behind us. One wonders, what are the challenges that you face day to day in the administration of this national monument? Yeah, so one of the big challenges we have is how to be relevant for people. Um, we're a small national monument, so it can be challenging sometimes for people to hear about us when they think of Yellowstone and Grand Tetons. So it's how to be relevant for people who are traveling through this area who may have never heard of Fossil Butte before or never thought of stopping here and really engaging with that next generation of people. Amanda, you're, you're part of the National Park Service, yet you don't charge fees to access the National Monument. So how is um, Fossil Butte funded? Yeah, so many national parks and monuments obviously do charge fees, and we are one that, that does not. Um, so we are all together in the National Park Service are funded through the Department of the Interior. So our funding comes from a lot of different places and doesn't necessarily have to come from fees. So we're able to not have an entrance fee here at Fossil Butte. Talk a little bit more about your outreach. What, what do you mean to this part of Wyoming? Um, are there K-12 
school, school experiences here. Do you have relationships with um, maybe undergraduate or graduate programs? Yeah, so we definitely have school groups come out from all the local schools in the area. Really anyone in the general community area can come here on a field trip. Um, so we generally do field trips in the spring and fall when our visitation is a little bit less than in the middle of the summer months and then when kids are still in school. Uh, we also just started a distance education program which is providing virtual field trips to people all across the country and around the world. How are those accessed? Yeah, so they're accessed through, um, we basically partner with a program called Skype in the Classroom so that teachers can go online and request a program with us and are able to do a half hour virtual field trip without having to worry about driving here in the winter. And if I want to learn more about Fossil Butte National Monument, if I haven't been able to visit, are there resources available? The web is where you direct folks. How can people learn more? Yeah, the website is definitely a great place for people, especially if they're remote, can learn more about that. Um, we're also active on social media, so they can look us up there and learn about what's going on at the monument or what conditions are like on any given day. Um, and the whole Skype in the Classroom thing, if teachers are out there and want to connect with us, it's a brand new way that we've adapted to be able to connect with people who aren't here. So is, is it year-round here at Fossil View, the Visitor Center is open. What can visitors experience um, spring, summer, fall, and winter? Yeah, so the summer is definitely our busiest time here where we get the majority of our visitors and we have the most services available. Um, those include ranger programs that are available daily that you can come in and uh, request a program with a ranger. We do different walks and talks so you can learn more about the monument. We also have our fossil preparation demonstrations that happen during the summer months, which actually show you the process of creating a beautifully displayed fossil and how, how we go about doing that. Um, the fall and spring are more of our shoulder season where we have some limited services but we're still open daily. In the winter we have the least amount of services so we're actually closed on Sundays in the winter time from December through March but otherwise we're entirely open for visitors to come here and experience the visitor center and have opportunities like cross-country skiing or snowshoeing. Fossil Butte became a national monument in 1972. It was established by an act of Congress, um, and basically it was a, a way to preserve this part of the Fossil Lake sediments um, as an area that could be preserved and protected for future generations. So Amanda, this is absolutely a, a beautiful place, and it's been our pleasure to visit with you. Our thanks to um, Liz and Arvid as well um, for being such wonderful hosts to us today on Wyoming Chronicle, and we certainly encourage our viewers to come pay a visit. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.